This is round one of the 2022 St. Louis Norm Congress. This was a GM Norm event with 10 players, round robins. So everyone plays everyone uh, once. Really nice conditions. It's extremely uh, pleasant to play at the, the St. Louis Chess Club. They really do um, a great job. And uh, yeah, round one, I'm playing against International Master Ivan uh, Skitko, who I think is um, attending one of the, the schools, I believe, in uh, one of the universities in, in Texas or maybe Missouri, um, has like a, a chess scholarship. And uh, yeah, strong player. Um, definitely, I, I feel like I've seen his rating be close to, to 2,500. So he was certainly one of the, the norm big norm seekers in, in the event. In, in this event, actually, I was... I think the number eight, or actually, I think it was the number nine seed, nine seed by rating. Um, there was one player lower rated than me, and most everyone was high rated, but not like so much high rated. Most of the field was between 24 and 2,500, um, with uh, a couple of exceptions, a couple of players above 2,500. Three GMs, and then um, a bunch of IMs, and I think one FM official, but I think uh, Evan Park, but I think he's already... I think he's like an I am elect, so he'll have his, his title soon. Um, okay, so d4, d6. And uh, yeah, this was a surprise for me. I actually saw my opponent had played this a couple times, but uh, for whatever reason, I just didn't spend... Uh, I just kind of forgot about it when I was preparing, because I was preparing for, for different systems. And uh, then when he played it over the board, I, yeah, of course, started kicking myself for not uh, <laughs> for not thinking about what I wanted to do here. And this is a tough move, actually, for, for d4 players sometimes, because... Um, if you're not willing to go e4, which I think is objectively the, the most ambitious move here, then you do have to make some kind of concession. So the move I played c4, this allows e5, which uh, I think generally is is pretty okay for black. Um, but I'll get into why exactly I, I went into this one. And I would say like the most natural move for d4 players, knight f3, if you don't want to play e4, um, this kind of restricts your options later on, especially if the opponent plays uh, King's Indian. So this is kind of a semi-well-known thing, but if you reach a King's Indian through this move order, well, then white is no longer able to play the F3 system, or in my case, you know, I like playing the H3 system where the knight stays on G1 and I go E4 and Bishop E3. So this one is also kind of ruled out um, for for white, as well as other stuff like the Averbach with like Bishop E2, Bishop G5, Bishop e2, Bishop e3 lines. So anything where the knight on, you know, f3 stays on g1 for a while is kind of ruled out. So this is a clever move order for black to get into the king's Indian as long as they don't mind uh, just switching to playing an e4 opening. And then they can either play the Pierce or, uh, in my opponent's case, he is a Philidor player, and then they're happy to play this one as well. Um, so... Yeah, it was kind of a bummer because I actually, I definitely wanted to play e4 in this position, um, but I just didn't really look into specifically what my opponent um, does from, I think he plays this position or maybe e5 first. And, um, you know, I've played Filter before, but just having like zero prep and yeah, having had the chance to look at his games and like not really exploring them too deeply, I was just like, oh, I really wish I had looked at this and it, yeah it felt kind of strange to go into it not really having any or a ton of let's say uh experience in this kind of position so for me i feel like this is actually a pretty big hole in my repertoire and i think next time i am just gonna bite the bullet and just play e4 and in the meantime i'm gonna learn some lines here and, and look at some games to kind of feel feel more comfortable because i do think that this is the critical move and, and this is the move that should be played and yeah, if I don't learn it, then people are still going to hit me with d6. And so, you know, it's going to continue to to be a problem. So I was aware of this move order hole. And that's why a little while ago, I prepared this line with uh, c4. And um, of course, this one allows e5, where it's not so good for white to take on e5. And the end game is, is totally fine for black. And um, but white does have one way I've always felt of putting some pressure here. Knight f3, I would say, is maybe the critical move, but then black plays e4, and this line, I think, is is pretty sharp, like knight g5, f5, and the position is, is pretty messy. I think it's playable, but, you know, it's very, very double-edged. So I go for knight c3, uh, essentially stopping e4, and I'm just wanting to, let's say, develop normally or play e4 myself and take a lot of space. 
Um, but of course this allows black to take on d4, get a tempo on the queen, and now I play queen d2. So it's kind of a weird move, but the setup I think is, is very well known. The idea is to put the bishop on b2, and then the queen actually makes make sense on d2. It's not just like in the way of the, the bishop on c1. Um, the other bishop goes to g2, and I've actually always felt like this structure is not the easiest for, for black to play. So for example, after knight f6, b3, if black, let's say, just plays like a normal king's Indian setup, and we get some position, g3, castles, bishop, g2, to rook e8, knight f3, um, I've played these positions as black, like as a king's Indian player, and I've always felt like they're very, very unpleasant, because white can castle here, just puts a knight on d5 at some point, these knights get traded, the pawn gets to d5, white gets this open c file, easy pressure on c7. The dark square bishops always get traded in this position, so black is never able to use the king's Indian bishop. And to me, this just feels like a position where white is uh, happily better. Um, and I feel like, you know, because this line, knight c3, doesn't get a lot of respect uh, these days. Most people think like, ah, this is just kind of whatever. I feel like it wasn't actually such a bad try thinking that my opponent might just make some natural moves and, and drift into maybe a somewhat worse position. But he spent a little bit of time here, not too much, like a couple minutes, and in this position he ends up playing a5, which is the, the top line of the engine. If you <laughs> turn this position on to the latest uh, Stockfish, or in my case I think I looked at it with, with Stockfish 14 or whatever. Um, and this move, a5, with the idea of just like a very early um, a4 advance, is uh, is very strong and, and very annoying. Um, so it felt like my opponent probably had looked at this and, and knew this idea, um, which was a bit of a shame, because I think this one doesn't like refute the line, but I think it, it equalizes quite comfortably for black. And... Um, yeah, it just kind of kills all the play for white. There's not much white white can do. So um, this was kind of like an opening experiment. You can say that didn't really didn't really work out. So bishop b2, um, a4. There's some concrete reason why white can't take with the knight here. Um, I don't think I really thought about it much during the game. I just know that. Oh yeah, I think it's d5. I think I actually did think about this. Yeah, d5 <laughs> is the problem. And then there's just like a lot of play in the center for black. There's like bishop b4 ideas, and I'm sure the engine shows that black is, is doing great here. So I didn't really think about this one too much. Um, instead, I played uh, rook to d1, which I believe was the move in, in my notes. I think knight d5 is also an option here. And all I could really remember is that the position is supposed to be um, about equal. So ab3, ab3. And, and black has achieved quite a bit with this early a5, a4 push, because now black has this like very, very nice target on, on b3. It really makes the position a lot easier for, for black to play. So g6, g3, bishop g7, bishop g2, castles, knight f3, and uh, and now knight d7. And of course, this move, you know, without the inclusion of like a5, a4, and takes on b3, this move would be nothing special. Knight c5 wouldn't come with a threat. But here, knight c5 is actually very annoying, because it's hitting the b3 pawn, and if I defend it with queen c2, I'm always getting hit with like knight b4. And uh, yeah, it's just like some weaknesses on, on the queen side here for white that I have to deal with. Um, so after some thought, I played knight to d5 here. And uh, I, think, I think in my notes, I had knight a4 as the main move. And then it's basically equal after bishop takes b2, queen takes, uh, queen f6, and... Black offers the queen trade and, and is fine in the end game. Is fine if white doesn't go for the end game. Basically, it's about equal. Like I think the position is playable for both sides, but uh, yeah, black doesn't really have many issues here. Um, I didn't really remember that during the game, so I was already on my own here for for some time. And yeah, I definitely didn't like my position because right, if I castle, then knight c5 comes, and it's actually really annoying to uh, defend this one. I can't go b4. Queen c2, knight b4, and yeah, not really clear what uh, what white should be doing here. Um, so knight d5, I felt like this is maybe the critical move. And here, of course, I'm threatening to take and put my queen on the long diagonal. And basically, if I can get this position, like bishop takes b2, queen takes b2, then I think white has a great position. Like the queen is super strong. I can even play like h4, h5 here. The knight on d5 is fantastic. 
I can castle, I can uh, leave my rook on the h file, I can just sh like shuffle the king over. Here white is doing great because black isn't able to challenge the diagonal with like uh, queen f6. Uh, of course the problem with knight d5 is that black has rook a2, which he plays in the game. And here I don't really have anything better than just to repeat with knight c3. Like if rook b1, then I think, well, number one, I'm pinned, so I'm not really threatening to untangle here, and so black can just play stuff like knight c5, and yeah, I don't think this is uh, so so great for white. I still need to castle and stuff. Um, so knight c3, he goes back rook a8. I also spent some time making sure that rook takes b2 is not like a uh, super serious sacrifice. It is kind of interesting, like I thought black can play queen f6 here, but then rook c1... Knight c5, and yeah, it's like not so easy for white here. Um, the engine even seems to think the immediate knight c5 is uh, even stronger for black, just threatening knight e4, putting pressure on b3, wanting to play knight b4, and apparently black has enough compensation for the exchange, which um, actually I, I, I totally believe. So this was an option, but okay, from black's point of view, it, you're not even getting a pawn for the exchange, and so it yeah, it's kind of hard to go for that one. Uh, so rook a8, uh, we repeat once, knight d5, and now knight c5 is played. So black kind of avoids the, the repetition. At this point, honestly, I was totally fine with the draw here. I felt like black had won the opening battle. You know, I tried something interesting, and he knew exactly how to just, like, equalize very comfortably. And yeah, I honestly felt like, if anything, the position is maybe even a little bit... Um, a little bit simpler for black to play with uh, the weakness on on b3. So at this point, I'm I'm okay with the draw, but my opponent decides to uh, to play on, which honestly I was kind of happy to see because it, it meant like okay he might take on some risk. Um, so I castle, c6. Uh, I drop back to c3. Now he made this committal move c6, which weakens the d6 pawn. So I want to bring my knight possibly to uh, to e4 at this point, and that's what kind of makes the the structure. A little bit unpleasant for black because they either have to tolerate this knight on d5 or they have to play c6 and then weaken uh, the d pawn. So trades, I go ef. Of course, bishop takes f3, I think was possible as well. I kind of liked ef here so that I could push f4 and uh, control the e5 square, which I thought was, was kind of nice. And then the bishop can still uh, exert pressure on the diagonal. Queen b6. And yeah, now black is going after this b3 pawn again. If queen c2, I have to watch out for uh, knight to c5. So taking on d6, I think didn't feel very good for me after taking on b3. White's pieces are all kind of uh, loose and, and weakened here. Um, so I play knight e4 here. Once again, I offer I offer the trade of dark sword bishops, which I think would be uh, in white's favor. Now, if black were to take on b3 here, I think I was pretty happy with this position, like taking on uh, g7, for example, king takes g7, and then either queen d4 check first, or knight takes d6, let's say check first, black plays somewhere, knight takes d6. This position felt like it would be very, very nice for me. I can push f4, f5 at some point, even use the f-pawn to kind of open up black's king, and the knight on d6 definitely felt like it would be uh, a really strong piece. Um, but of course, black doesn't have to allow this. Bishop takes b2, queen takes b2, I think would also be good for white. Once again, black has rook a2. And again, I have nothing better than to just repeat. And, and once again, I'm kind of asking my opponent, like either he accepts a draw here, or he has to kind of take some more uh, concessions. Of course, bishop c3, queen c3, I think would probably not be too playable. Uh, so he goes back rook a8, I play knight e4, and from white's point of view, I also just don't have anything better than to uh, than to repeat. I thought about knight a4 here, but I think queen takes b3 was the problem, and yeah, my knight on a4 ends up getting, getting kind of stranded. Um, so knight a4, rook a2, I play knight c3, and here black continues the game once again with queen takes b3. Now this one was really surprising, because here... It's not like black is maybe accepting uh, like a slightly worse position here. Like black is actually sacrificing uh, an exchange, um, which which was very bold. I think justified. I mean, I don't think black actually had any uh, any losing chances after this decision. 
um, but still kind of kind of surprising. So knight takes a2. Uh, I take the rook. Now if queen takes a2, bishop takes g7. This is not what black wants to trade off these pieces. Like queen takes, rook takes, king takes g7, white takes on d6. Here I think white is just a clean exchange up. Black doesn't even... Okay, black maybe has... You can argue black has a pawn for it because white's pawns are, are doubled. But one day white will just trade off the f pawn and yeah, we'll just have like just a clean exchange up. So... That's not what, what black uh, goes for. He plays queen takes b2. So he takes the dark squared bishop, which, of course, is the, the much stronger piece. Yeah, now we get this strange position where I trade queens, I go rook takes d6, and at the moment it's just rook versus bishop, so white is an exchange up. But black goes knight b6, and you kind of see his idea that c4 pawn is very weak, and if black is able to win this one, then it's like he has two connected pass pawns on the queen side, which are generally very strong, right? So, you know, a bishop plus two connected passers is going to be really difficult for a rook to uh, to deal with. So, mathematically, I'm like way up in material, but actually, like, once black takes the c4 pawn, it actually starts to look very, very scary. So, yeah, this was uh, definitely tough, a tough situation for me. Like, I really had a struggle trying to figure out what to do here. Of course, I looked for, you know, tactical solutions, but rook b1, knight takes c4, just didn't see any any good follow-up because black hits the rook and then uh, drop the bishop back whenever he needs to or play b5 if the rook moves away or, you know, bishop comes out. Also, bishop f5 is coming, so I didn't really see how um, I'm going to achieve anything here with the rook on, on the b-file. So eventually I decided to just go rook fd1 because if c5 then knight a4 and there's no way to defend the pawn anyway. Um, I think, I mean according to the computer actually white has many ways to let's say keep, keep the balance here but this is one of those positions where it definitely feels like one mistake by white and the pawn start running and you end up losing. Um, so so yeah, it's really not clear what's the cleanest way of uh, of playing this. Um, I think I was thinking about knight c1 here. Uh, just in my analysis a little bit, knight d3, something like this, forcing a trade of knights. And yeah, this might not be so easy for black to get their pawns rolling, because the rook comes to b1, pawn comes to f4, and it's hard to push the pawns uh super easily here for black. So I think white is reasonably safe here, but this was an example of the position I was kind of worried about during the game, because again, if the pawns start rolling, like they're just very, very strong. The pieces can feel kind of helpless. So after some thought, I end up going rook fd1. And my idea is uh, basically, I just want to force off a trade of rooks. And I, I felt like this was a good call because well, Black's Rook can be very active, and in general, when you're up the exchange, you do want to trade off the opponent's Rook so that they don't have, you know, such a mobile piece. Um, so Bishop F6, I trade, King takes, I played F4 here, King E7, and uh, now Knight B4. And uh, yeah, so Black has gotten his two pawns. Uh, I did achieve something, I think, by, by trading off a, a pair of Rooks. I really wasn't sure. I felt like White shouldn't be necessarily... Uh, losing in this position, but practically, yeah, it just felt like it's so much easier for, for white to go wrong here, and all of a sudden the pawns uh, start to move. Uh, so bishop f5, and yeah, at this point I was having a hard time figuring out what to do. It's not clear like what black's next move is, because the pawns seem kind of stuck. If the b pawn moves, the c pawn falls. If the c pawn moves, there's a knight d5 check. The king is also cut off. So if I allow the king to c7, then I think it becomes really problematic because suddenly the pawns might be able to uh, start to mobilize. Um, but it's also hard for me to come up with a concrete plan. You know, I, I really don't like positions where I just have to kind of sit and wait back and forth and not do anything. Um, but yeah, here it just felt like it's tough. You know, my knight doesn't have such a stable square. I don't know what to do on, on the king side with my pawns either. And so maybe I'm holding the pawns, but yeah, what to do exactly? If I start shuffling with my rook, black improves the king. So I end up just taking. 
which I'm honestly not sure. I, I think it's actually a pretty good practical decision. I mean, I believe the, the position is drawn either way. Um, but this one to me just felt like a position that I could hold more comfortably, where I don't have to worry about these uh, super strong pass pawns. So what happens here is now white has a rook for two pieces, rook and pawn, so we have four versus three. And uh, I do have to be careful about what kind of endgames you know, we end up with here, but basically my feeling was if I can get rook against two bishops, then that position should be uh, an easy draw. Not easy, but it should be drawn. Um, and if I get rook versus bishop and knight with an extra pawn, like four versus three, then I thought that um, should be holding as well. But I really wanted to avoid that. I think the big rule of thumb for these kinds of positions um, is that it's actually, if you have the rook, you want to have the rook against the two bishops. You don't want to have rook against bishop and knight. So these are for situations when all the pawns are on the same side. Like for example, three versus three, you want rook against two bishops, not rook versus bishop and knight. And the reason for that is the two bishops, although they're strong when there's like stuff happening on both sides of the board, when there's only stuff happening on one side of the board, they're actually not as good as the bishop and knight, because the bishop and knight, they can actually attack the same square, right? Whereas two bishops, they cannot have the same target. And so that's, that's what makes them actually harder um, to win with in these kinds of situations. Whereas if you have just bishop and knight against rook, all you have to do is attack something and take it. So it's actually very logical, right? If you have like three versus three, and then black puts like a knight on g4, bishop on c5, and then just takes this pawn, even if the pawn is defended by the rook, black is still winning a pawn and ending up with three versus two in a king and pawn endgame and, and winning the game. Whereas the two bishops, they can't really do that. They have to just, they just have to hope that the king and bishop are able to attack something and the rook isn't able to... Uh, defend it. So that was my idea. I don't know from a, you know, objectively, I think the position is still drawn from a practical sense. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to judge exactly what uh, white's best chances were. But anyway, black, of course, uh, continues the game. And um, I play bishop b5 here. And this is to kind of make sure that I can trade off the knight. So king c5, bishop f1. And uh, he goes knight d3. I mean, I think probably from Black's point of view, it would have been better maybe to keep the knight. Because I do think after knight d3 takes takes, I feel like this position should be should be drawn and also not necessarily that hard to hold. Um, although I do end up giving my opponent some chances. But with the knights on the board, I, I feel like that one will always be a little bit tougher for white to deal with. But I don't know. That's just my feeling. So knight d3 takes takes, rook e8. Now, basically, black has one plan here, right, that we have to understand, and that is king goes to e2 or f3, bishop on this diagonal, and black tries to take this f2 pawn. Like, that's the only way that black can really win this position. And white has to make sure that we're not allowing this plan, um, which is easier, easier said than done, actually, because sometimes the rook just, like, runs out of squares. Um, so bishop f5, rook a8, my idea is basically just to keep the rook flexible, Maybe I can um, put pressure on this one. I can always threaten and force black to always keep this square covered. And I also want to be able to give checks from the, the back and give checks from the side as well. So that the king is never able um, to, uh, to fully win uh, or to fully, to fully get in and, uh, and infiltrate. So bishop e6, rook a4, bishop d4. Uh, he starts kind of infiltrating here. And I don't think there's a way to really prevent the king from, from getting in. Um, so my idea is just to eventually make it hard for black to coordinate. So here I'm like keeping the bishop pinned. Um, now bishop d5 check, king f1, king d2, go rook a7 here. Bishop e6, rook a4. Now I'm just kind of stopping bishop d4. So uh, he gives this check, king g1, uh, h5 here. Played rook a7, now going after this pawn, bishop d4. And so this is already a moment where white has to be very careful. Uh, because if I take this f7 pawn, for example, then after king e2, I'm not actually able to defend this one. And in fact, I think 
my king is just getting mated because black is taking, moving this king here, and then playing bishop g2. So rook e7 check, king f3, and uh, I think it's game over. So that's an example of how white can still very easily uh, lose this. Um, but instead I played rook a4, which I think is not, not the most challenging move to find, right? Just latching onto the bishop. And if black keeps shuffling, then the rook will just kind of keep targeting the bishop and never giving black a chance to set up their attack with king to e2. Um, and this is where you can see like where, yeah, maybe a knight would be more useful because a knight could just land on g4 and then, yeah, help out. Um, so king d3, I shuffle, rook b4, h4. Now, for some reason here, I played rook a4. I actually really didn't understand why I did this. My first instinct was to just take this pawn because as a defending side, I'm trying to trade off as many pawns as possible. Somehow, I just felt like it didn't really matter whether I take this one or not. I should note, I mean, at this point, I'm in time trouble. I'm basically playing on the increment here. The time control is 90 plus 30. So we're, we're down to the end of the game. Basically have like a minute or two left and 30 second increment. Yeah, it's very tough to make decisions sometimes um, when, you know, you don't have a lot of time to think about it. But yeah, I should have just taken this pawn immediately. I, I'm not even sure what I was afraid of during the game, but I was probably just seeing some ghosts. Um, I go rook a4 and uh, black plays bishop g4. And now I take, because I, I really don't want to see the pawn landing on h3. Um, but black could have gone bishop d7 here with the tempo on the rook. And I don't know if he... If he missed this or, or what happened, maybe he thought I would have uh, like rook a3 check or something. Um, but this one is actually not super easy for um, for white because black king comes into e2. Let's say give this check. Maybe the king even sticks around on f3. And yeah, I mean, the king gets more active here and now it can possibly even win the f pawn. And so this is just like, uh, a better version for black. Maybe there's rook d2 here, but I still think bishop d7 was um, just a much better try here. Actually, maybe rook a3 check and uh, king e4 right away is kind of a better version for black. And then black is ready to take this pawn. And then I have to be very careful here because if, if I just like go for something like this, you know, I'm probably going to lose this pawn one day. In that position, I think definitely not a guarantee that, that white is holding it. You know, black spawns start running down, f5, f4, and, and so on. Um, so, yeah, actually, there was a famous version of this endgame in the Carlson Kriakin World Championship match where Carlson had um, two bishops against a rook, three versus three, and actually created some winning chances in that game. He had a moment where he could have been winning, even multiple moments, but then Kriakin ended up holding it. So yeah, you can get chances here with the, uh, with the two bishops sometimes. Um, but anyway, so h4, rook a4, black goes bishop g4. Now I get a second chance here. I just take on h4 immediately. And um, yeah, now black isn't really in time to kind of get everything uh, going. So bishop f3, king f1, bishop f6. Uh, I play rook a7 here going after this one, bishop d5. And now I think very important move f5 because I'm actually forcing black to trade off some of my pawns here and um, yeah, just leaving black without enough winning material. Because if black takes this one, then this pawn starts running. I play h5 and here, okay, black has to be careful that this pawn doesn't uh, doesn't just queen one day. Um, so here white just gets uh, too much counterplay and also black's pawns are doubled. So yeah, a lot fewer winning chances with this one. Um, so now I think white is essentially just completely fine and the game ends up uh, just quickly petering out here. Now black just has one pawn left and yeah, not really enough to win the game and I was able to uh, just immediately force the trade and yeah, we agreed to a draw here because neither side uh, really has any kind of reasonable winning chances anymore. Even if I'm able, like at this point, I'm the only one with pawns left. So maybe white is the only one <laughs> with the right to play on here. But yeah, even if I'm able to promote the pawn and force black to like give up the bishop for it, that in game is just like a very easy draw with king and bishop against rook. So um, not much point in uh, playing on from here. So yeah, first round, kind of a tough draw. 
Um, not a super fun game, but I did feel happy that I held the end game. I mean, it wasn't exactly the easiest end game to hold, but I felt like I, I played reasonably well and didn't give my opponent um, too many chances. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll call it there.